Witch's Sister by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor, Chapter 6. Lynn could see it all clearly now, how perfectly it had been arranged, how expertly the details had been planned. The Morleys would be gone and Mrs. Tuggle would be in charge. She had been awake for a half hour the following morning, wondering what to do, and was about to get up and call Mouse when she heard footsteps on the stairs. She lay very still, pretending sleep. It was Mrs. Morley. Glancing over at Lynn, she softly pushed open the curtain to Judith's room and went in. Lynn waited, her ears straining to hear. Judith, came Mother's voice. Judith, wake up. It's almost time for us to leave. I want to talk to you before I go. What about, came Judith's sleepy reply. Are you awake? I guess so. What's the matter? I want to know something, the bed creaked as Judith turned over. What? I want to know what this is. There was silence. What is it? I can't see. It's a small black box filled with ashes, that's what. Give me that, Judith's voice suddenly came alive. You're not supposed to touch that. Why? What on earth? It's something of mine that's private, that's all. I wish you people would stay out of my things. I didn't get into your things, came Mrs. Morley's voice, still surprised. I found it under the glider on the porch. I'm curious. What are the ashes of? Just, just something I want to keep, that's all. Again, there was a period of silence. Then why did you burn it? I just wanted to. Where did you get this black hat? Mrs. Tuggle gave it to me. Judith, Mrs. Morley's voice was impatient. Is there anything I should know before I go away this weekend? Anything at all? What about? About you or Mrs. Tuggle? At that moment, the third-floor bedroom was enveloped in shadows. A sudden rush of wind swept across the floor, billowing the curtain that separated the girls' rooms. There was a crash from Judith's side as a picture blew off the dresser. Ye gods, I'd better close that window. I'd better close the window, said Judith, springing up. It's going to blow my stuff all over. The wind started last night. It has been unusually gusty, Mother said. I'd better see about Lynn's windows. She stopped. What about it, Judith? Is there anything I should know? Of course not, said Judith. Don't be silly. Mother left, and Judith went back to bed. Lynn waited a little longer, her heart pounding, and then got up and went downstairs. A few minutes later, Mother came through the hall with her suitcase and picked up Stevie. She held him very close for a moment and then gave him a big smacking kiss on the neck. I'm going to miss my boy, she said. You'd be a big help to Mrs. Tuggle now and show her where I keep things. Mrs. Morley also hugged Lynn. Now listen, now listen, she said in a kind of forced cheerfulness. Should anything happen and you need me, I left the phone number of the writer's conference by the telephone. But I'm sure everything is going to be fine. I have two lovely daughters I can trust, and I know you'll get along. And then, as though she was afraid she would change her mind, she picked up her suitcase and followed father down the walk. It's the old imagination working overtime, Lynn heard her father saying jovially. Probably a love letter Judith spurned and can't bear to throw away. You're just as bad as Lynn, honey. Worse, even. That's where the girl gets it. From you. Lynn watched with sinking heart as the car pulled away and her parents in it, with her parents in it. She felt helpless about the coming night. Mouse, she said over the phone. It's awful. They're gone. What? Who? My folks. Mom is speaking at a writer's conference in Illinois. And Dad drove her. They won't be back till tomorrow night. There was silence from the other end. And Mouse's voice came like a rush of wind over the wire. Lynn, tonight, the full moon, didn't you tell them? They didn't believe me, Lynn said miserably. I tried. Oh, Mouse, what will I do? I'm scared. Can't you come over? I've got a piano recital this afternoon, Mouse wailed. I've got to play Chopin's Polonaise. You didn't tell me you were in a recital. That's because it's going to be awful. I hope nobody comes. Well, this is going to be awful, too. Listen, Lynn, whatever you do, don't eat any of Mrs. Tuggle's cooking. That's important. I know all about the potions they put in food. You'll fall asleep and won't wake up till tomorrow afternoon. Lynn took a deep breath and tried to stop the panic. And Lynn, one more thing. Chapter 13, second paragraph. Dipping into milk or water is necessary before one can be transformed. For goodness sake, don't let Mrs. Tuggle give Stevie a bath. Stevie came back in from the porch. He had dressed himself that morning and, his sh and, he, and had his shirt on backwards. Lynn helped him put it on again and tenderly combed his hair. How could Judith even consider getting rid of him, the chubby little child who called sandwiches sandwiches and wanted to know if God ever wore boots? 
The house wouldn't be the same without Stevie. In fact, no matter what happened now, it would probably never be the same again. She silently made her breakfast. I like Mrs. Tuggle, Stevie said from the table where he swung his legs back and forth and munched a piece of toast. This is going to be fun, isn't it, Lynn? It was impossible to say yes. Why do you like Mrs. Tuggle so much? Mommy left me with her once when she went shopping and Mrs. Tuggle gave me candy and told me stories, Stevie said. What kind of stories did she tell you? Stevie thought about it, licking the jelly off the sides of his mouth. About the hobbyas? The what? The hobbyas. They burn down houses and kill the old man and woman and carry the little girl off in a sack. Lynn said no more. Had Mother no sense? Didn't she see through Mrs. Tuggle at all? What would she say if she got back from Illinois and Stevie was gone? Lynn sent him out to play in the sand and cleared off the breakfast dishes. Judith came downstairs at 11. She was wearing her best pair of jeans and a fresh polka dot shirt. There was a touch of makeup on her face and small earrings in her pierced ears. This time, her hair had been pulled back with a red scarf. Going somewhere? Lynn asked, wondering. No, I'm just getting ready for the Tuggles. I think we should all look decent and straighten the house up. A little if they're going to sleep here. What do you mean they? Judith seemed to avoid looking at her. Mrs. Tuggle and her grandson, Clyde. He's sleeping here too? Why not? He can't very well stay in her big house alone if Mrs. Tuggle is going to be down here. He'll sleep on the back porch or somewhere. Now it was three against two. Lynn and Stevie against two witches and a warlock. What's he like? Lynn quizzed, trying to keep Judith talking. Judith shrugged. Nice. I hope you like civil while he's here and that you and Marjorie won't go around hiding behind doors and acting like creeps. She made it sound so natural, so normal. Have you seen my yellow ribbon? She asked suddenly. What yellow ribbon? Lynn stammered. The one I've been wearing all week, Judith said. Have you seen it? The question was so direct that it took Lynn by surprise. Why do you need it? She asked in return. You're wearing a scarf. It's important to me, that's why, Judith snapped. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it anywhere around the house, Lynn hedged. Judith stared through the hall to the living room and then turned around, one eyebrow raised. Have you seen it outside the house then? Lynn couldn't think of an answer. Lynn, I mean it, Judith warned. If you've seen my ribbon, tell me. Lynn's mind raced. Judith didn't ask where it was. She knew. She wanted to know if Lynn knew. That was the important thing. Maybe Lynn could bargain with her. Maybe I have and maybe I haven't, Lynn answered. If you talk Mrs. Tuggle out of coming here tonight, I'll tell you. Talk her out of coming? Why? There were footsteps on the back porch and then Stevie's excited voice. Hey, Judith, look what I found. Both girls wheeled around and there stood Stevie, his legs covered with dirt, holding a small sa holding a sand shovel in one hand and Judith's doll in the other. My mannequin, Judith cried. Where did you find it, Stevie? I was just digging around the house, around the rose bush, and my shovel hit something, and I dug it up. It was in an oatmeal box, and I, it was an oatmeal box, and I found the doll inside. He beamed importantly. Judith turned and stared at Lynn, the color rising in her face. But Lynn was not prepared for what happened next. Judith lunged at her, pinning her hand against the wall, her fingernails digging into Lynn's cheek. You took it. I know you did, Lynn shrieked and she looked strangely flushed. Even her hands felt hot. I've had just, I've just had enough. You're always into my things. You always ruin my plans. Don't you ever take anything that belongs to me again. Ever, ever, ever. Lynn screamed, and Stevie started to cry. Judith dropped her hands and stood there, breathing hard. Do you know where that ribbon is? She said through clenched teeth. Yes, Lynn replied weakly. It's in the cemetery on the angels. You saw it then! Judith stared at her strangely for almost a full minute. Then she turned and walked quickly out the front door. Lynn ran one hand over the scratches on her cheek, her heart pounding. She looked in the hall mirror and gasped, for the scratches were in the form of an X, as though she were marked for some dark purpose. Stevie was whimpering. You scare me when you fight, he said. Lynn took him into the living room. She put Judith's doll on the mantel, then sat Stevie on her lap. It had been years since she and Judith had, act had actually hit each other. She felt frightened at the intensity of Judith's anger, as though in her bewitchment Judith was just as helpless against Mrs. Tuggle's power as Lynn. 
It was as if the real Judith had disappeared and someone else were inhabiting her body. Lynn shivered. Listen, Stevie, she said quickly. Judith isn't, she isn't feeling too good these days. I guess she might do some awfully strange things. I want you to listen carefully. Don't go anywhere at all with Judith. Do you understand me? You stay right where I can see you all the time and tell me if she does anything that seems odd. Stevie looked at Lynn anxiously. I'll tell Mrs. Tuggle on her if she does. No, Stevie, tell me. Mrs. Tuggle might do strange things too. Just trust me. Nobody else, okay? Stevie put his head against Lynn's shoulder. I wish Mommy was home. So do I, Stevie. So do I. When Judith came back later, she had a boy with her. He was an inch shorter than Judith, with muscular legs and arms and blondish hair that came down over his ears and curled down the back of his neck. His eyes were pale blue, and there was a starry look around his face, as though he had been born in another age and lived in a different time. He carried an astronomy book and a folder of papers and charts. Lynn stared at him intently as he came in the house. Yes, no doubt about it, he looked like the picture of the drowned boy in Mrs. Tuggle's living room. Not exactly like it, of course, for the boy in the picture was only six, and he wasn't murdered till he was sixteen, but still the resemblance was striking. Lynn, this is Clyde Tuggle, Judith said with cold politeness. For a moment her eyes met Lynn's, and there was a flicker of concern for the marks on her sister's cheek. Then her eyes seemed to turn into limpid, into limpid pools of nothingness. Hi, said the boy. Hi, Lynn said back, unsmiling. Mrs. Tuggle will be down later, she led Clyde out to the back porch. They sat down on the glider. The boy from Cowden's Creek opened his folder and took out a map of the heavens and spread it across their laps. Lynn listened to their whispered conversation, trying to find out what they had in mind. In every way possible, she had to ruin their plan for the evening. If necessary, she could even get Mouse to come over and spend the night. That way, the cone of power would have to work in several directions all at once and maybe it wouldn't be strong enough to get Stevie outside at midnight. About 4.30, Lynn was in the living room working on a puzzle with Stevie when a patch of sunlight on the floor faded away. The room grew dark, and a faraway rumble of thunder sounded from the north end of Cowden's Creek. Lynn looked around. Mrs. Tuggle was standing in the doorway, and Lynn jumped as though she had never seen the woman before in her life. "'Wasn't meaning to startle you,' Mrs. Tuggle said quickly. "'I've brought something from home for our supper.' So I'll slide it into the oven. She went into the kitchen and opened the oven door. Just like the witch in Hansel and Gretel, Lynn thought. Shortly afterward, the old woman came back into the living room. She was wearing an apron over her brown dress, and she sat down on a chair with her bony hands on her knees. Well, 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 she said, looking about her. The house is all ready. The children are quiet. The children quiet. The kettle on for tea. And I'll not have much to do with I. Did she only imagine it, Lynn wondered, or was there something malicious about Mrs. Tuggle's smile? Lynn's going to take care of me while my mommy's away, Stevie told her. And a good sister she is, too, Mrs. Tuggle said. Thunder sounded again from the north and seemed to linger, rumbling along Cowden's Creek from one end of the town to the other. Judith and and the boy came back in from the porch. I think we'll take a walk before dinner, Mrs. Tuggle, Judith said. Want me to set the table before we leave? Best to go and get yourselves back before it storms, the old lady said. Lynn and I will do for ourselves. The screen door slammed behind Judith and Clyde. Mrs. Tuggle opened the lid of her sewing basket and took out a sleeve she was working on. Even that looked strange in her hands, an armless sleeve attached to nothing. Out in the kitchen, the kettle began to whistle softly, and the old woman let it sing. There wasn't anything... About Mrs. Tuggle that looked natural, Lynn decided. Her one gray eye and one green eye were somehow placed too close on the center of her face, crowding her long, thin nose, which looked pinched in the middle. Her dark stockings were wrinkled about her ankles, and her fingers worked the nimbleness of a woman who had done nothing all her life but sit in an attic and spin. Stevie soon tired of the puzzle and forgot whatever feelings he was supposed to have against Mrs. Tuggle. He sauntered over and leaned on her chair, watching her needle speed in and out. "'Are you a brownie?' he asked finally, curious about her dark dress. Mrs. Tuggle laughed, and one of her teeth flashed gold when her mouth opened. (laughs) "'Goodness no, child. A brownie is a sort of boggle, you know, with pointy ears and hair all over. "'Is that bad?' Stevie wanted to know. "'Well, now, that's depending on how you look at it. 
If you have a treasure, you know, you bury it, tend your scattered drops of lamb's blood over it. A brownie will watch over it for you and frighten everyone else away. That's not too so bad now, is it? Stevie thought it over. Who kills the lamb? For a moment, Mrs. Tuggle was taken aback. Well, now that I don't know, lad. The house was quiet, and the clock in the hall seemed louder than ever. Out in the kitchen, the strange kettle continued its croon. Again, thunder, and then the strange stillness, as though everything were waiting, waiting. What if it's not a treasure that's buried, Stevie went on imagining. What if it's a dead man? Will the brownie watch over him too? That's a boy, Stevie, Lynn thought. Keep her talking. Well now, lad, if it's a man that's died a natural death, he needs no looking after, you know, save by God. And if it's a murdered man, well, then his bones might tell who did it. What do you mean, Mrs. Tuggle? asked Lynn. They say that if a body's been murdered, his bones will speak out to anybody walking overhead and say who twas that killed him. It's all a story, you know. What if it's not, though, Lynn pestered, her thoughts speeding ahead of her, wildly putting things together. What if there was someone right here in our own cemetery who had been murdered and the murderess wanted to stop his bones from talking? Mrs. Tuggle looked at Lynn, her needle pausing for a moment. What a storyteller you are, my child, she said. You'll be scaring your brother so he can't sleep. Lynn ignored it. Do you think the murderess would try to conjure him up again and turn him into a warlock or something? Goodness how you go on. That may be, but would have to be witchcraft for sure. How many witches do you think it would take, Mrs. Tuggle? Lynn asked, her eyes looking straight into the old woman's face. Would two be enough? One little one and one big one? Mrs. Tuggle didn't answer for a moment. She picked up the sleeve and began picking at it again. That I don't know about, dear, she said. And it's best we talk of something else with Stevie about, don't you think? Lynn said nothing more, determined to stand her ground. However, she continued to stare in the old woman's face till Mrs. Tuggle noticed and looked up. For a full ten seconds, they looked into each other's eyes, neither giving an inch. Then slowly, Mrs. Tuggle's lips spread into a knowing grin, and the gold tooth shone brightly inside the dark cavern of her mouth. And that's the end of chapter six.